This is the second in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we're going to consider how we construct some examples of manifolds and how we can prove that they are, in fact, manifolds. Last time we talked about sets with smooth structures, and um, we found that there were difficulties in using that notion as a, as a concept of manifold because there were three problems we could run into. Sometimes maybe these sets with smooth structure would have different parts with different dimension, which we didn't like. They might not be Hausdorff, which was a very really serious problem, and also they might have some problem with having too many open sets being, in some sense, really um, more complicated than we'd like them to be, uh, unnecessarily complicated objects. So we'd like to have a test to make sure that they don't have too many open sets, that they have a countable basis of open sets, and we'd like a test to see if they're Hausdorff. Um, so we have some kind of simple tests test for a countable basis. Um, so this is very simple, a, um, a set with smooth structure. So we write down some atlas of, 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 of charts. Um, a set with smooth structure has um, a countable uh, basis of open sets for its topology just when it has a countable set of charts inside that smooth structure um, whose domains cover the set. So we have a set with smooth structure, some M, and we want to cover the whole thing, but we only want to use a countable set of charts from our, uh, from our smooth structure. The proof is very elementary. If you took a countable basis, if you could have, if there was one, some countable basis, say V1, V2, and so on, of open sets for that smooth structure, if it did happen to have such a thing, then you could take each of the um, charts, and um, you could consider constructing um, if uh, if some vi lies inside that u, you could look at um, just at uh, vi and phi i, where phi i is just phi restricted to vi. So, um, so if you happen to have one of the sets from one of the base from the basis sitting inside the domain of some chart you could restrict the chart to it and that way for at least all the small enough elements of this countable all small enough open sets from this countable basis you'd get a chart on them but we know that every point lies inside uh, the domain of some chart and that it also lies inside one of these basis elements and you can make the basis elements as small as you like and lie inside that that chart domain so every point uh, in the, every point in, in this guy uh, li lies inside um, some uh, inside some one of these vi's, which happens to lie inside one of these u's, and so uh, so therefore we have uh, this chart vi phi i uh, covering that uh, that point m naught and and everywhere nearby that point m naught. So we've shown the, that if you have a countable uh, set of, of, if you have a countable basis for the topology, then you must have a countable set of charts which cover the the entire uh, the entire set with smooth structure. On the other hand, if you have a, a countable set of charts that cover um, the uh, the set with smooth structure, uh, then you can uh, you can turn this around. So if you have a countable um, set of charts, um, some UIs, phi eyes, then um, what you can do is each one of them has some image, some phi i of UI open inside Euclidean space, and then you cover this in, in some countable, uh, countable basis. So you have countably many of these, and countably many countable basis for this, and countable times countable is countable, and so it's not too hard to put that together. Uh, let you 
fill in the details to make sure that you can actually produce a uh, accountable set of, of, uh, of, of um, accountable basis for the topology of the whole set with smooth structure. So summing up, we found that a, a, a set with a smooth structure uh, has a countable basis of open sets just when we can write down a countable set of charts whose domains cover the whole set. So when we, if we can get away with just using a countable collection of charts, then we know that we don't have to worry about the, the countability of the resulting topology. The countable basis exists. Now what about a test for being Hausdorff? Um, and that's, again, again, as I pointed out before, the, the more fundamental issue, uh, the problem of being Hausdorff. Um, test for Hausdorff. Um, Hausdorffness. Um, how do we check um, a set with smooth structure? Is Hausdorff just when um, any two points, we have to get them housed off, so we're going to try and house them off. Any two points um, either uh, lie, so one possibility is they lie in the domain of the same chart. So you can find a chart that covers both of them. Or the other possibility is maybe they lie um, in disjoint chart domains. Now that's for some charts in the smooth structure, not necessarily the charts that we actually gave in our atlas. When we construct the set with smooth structure, we don't really write down the whole smooth structure. We only write down an atlas. And maybe the atlas doesn't have these properties. But somehow we have to, to construct maybe a bigger atlas, which does and which has, uh, which lies in the same smooth structure. You know, in other words, which doesn't uh, alter the, the transition maps too, too wildly, so the transition maps stay smooth. How do we prove this? So let's suppose that we had two points that lie in the domain of some chart. So they're both in the domain of the same chart that's going to turn this into some set in Euclidean space. Um, so then, uh, then of course, uh, we can take, because Euclidean space is, is Hausdorff, we can house them off in Euclidean space. And then we just simply copy that back here uh, to our set with smooth structure and house them off. Okay, so that's what happens if they're in the same chart of the, uh, of the same, uh, the domain of the same chart. What if they're in domains of different charts? This one's a domain of one chart, and this one's a domain of another chart. Uh, that's fine, B2, because, um, uh, because, of course, now they're already housed off. You can see them housed off. So that's fine. So that's how the, how the proof works. It's not very exciting. Um, and conversely, the, the, the converse is, is easy enough to prove. So, um, so that's our, our test, how we can test for being Hausdorff. Let's see if we can do it in some examples. So let's go back to look at our, one of our classic examples, lines in the plane, which is not a trivial, topologically trivial manifold, actually. It's an interesting manifold. So M is the set of lines in the Euclidean plane, lines in the plane. And we had two charts. We remember that we had two charts. Right? U is the set of not uh, vertical lines, all lines that aren't vertical. And we had, let's say, V is the set of not horizontal lines. And we had uh, charts um, given by phi of the line y equals m x plus b equals the m in the b. So we just describe a line using numbers, its slope and intercept. But um, we had another chart, which was, uh, say, v c uh, given by c of the line with equation x equals n y plus c equals the pair n and c. Since every line is either not horizontal or not vertical, um, line can't be both horizontal and vertical, uh, these cover the whole the whole of m, the whole set of lines in the plane. And so we've uh, we got m is u union v. 
So we have two charts, and all we need are the two, and therefore we know we, we know that it has a countable basis of open sets. By our test, our test said we had to somehow cover with countably many charts. We covered with two charts, so that's uh, countable, so that's fine. We have to worry about Hausdorff. That's the more difficult issue. In this case, it's actually not obvious um, whether or not it's Hausdorff. We have to think about why it would be Hausdorff. Well, it turns out that our test for Hausdorff doesn't work in this case because um, we have, uh, in the case of the U chart, there are some vertical lines which are not in U. And then, of course, there are also some horizontal lines. And they're not in V. Um, so we can't use a single chart to cover the whole thing. And so if you pick a, a vertical line and I pick a horizontal line, those are two different points of M, two different points of M. But uh, we could say then, well, they're not in the same chart domain. So that doesn't work. Okay. The test was, though, they should either be in the same chart domain or they should be in disjoint chart domains. But U and V are our only charts, uh, chart domains, and they're not disjoint. So we can't use the test either way. We have a problem that... This guy is uh, is not in U, this guy's not in V, but U and V overlap because they overlap in all of the lines that are that are not horizontal or vertical, which is pretty much all the lines. So U and V are really um, enormous. There, there's almost nothing that's not in U, almost nothing that's not in V. So it's actually hard uh, to find anything that isn't, that, that the overlap is enormous to find any way to keep them apart. So how do we do this? What are we going to do? Well, let's let, uh, let's take a new, let's say, instead of U, we'll take some sort of, I don't know, let's say U not contained in U, um, uh, which will be a subset, which is the set of, um, the set of lines um, of the special form, what, which was Y equals MX plus B, um, with uh, some constraint on M minus a half, less than, less than M, less than a half, let's say. So that's an open set because it's identified with the, the coordinate M being uh, by, under, our, under our chart. It's identified with the coordinate M being between minus a half and a half. And so it's cl clearly an open condition on M, so that's an open set. And we'd have to check, of course, that it's also open uh, under the other guy. What about V? Um, is, is it open in, the, in, the, in, this, in the C chart? And it is, so I, I won't do the, the, the details. You'd have to check, okay, that the, the, um, the corresponding uh, slope is a reciprocal slope. And so if you have an open condition on the slope M, that's also an open condition on the reciprocal slope N. And so it becomes an open condition uh, in, on, on the... Um, on the other chart, and so U is open. So to check that U is open, what I had to do was to check that 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 U uh, that that U intersect. Uh, sorry, U not uh, to check U not is open. I had to check that the part of it lies in U as identified with an open set by by phi, and the part that lies in V is open identified with an open set by by C. And I did that because this is an open condition on the M, so that's the chart phi. And the chart C, we have just a reciprocal slope, and so we get a reciprocal slope condition, which I don't want to write out. Um, so that's also perfectly fine. Um, so it does work out that, uh, that this is an open set, and similarly we can make some sort of v naught, which is the set of lines um, x equals uh, n y plus c such that uh, minus a half is less than n is less than a half or sorry is less than a half and if you do that um, the reciprocal guy will um, will not be uh, th these don't overlap the reciprocal guy won't satisfy the other the other condition so in fact u naught intersect v naught is empty Okay, so, so that's what we had to do. To make it work, you have to find some smaller open sets. We have to actually check these are open sets, and to do that, you have to check what their images are in both the phi and the C chart, in, in all of your charts. So to make sure that in all your charts, they remain open. Um, so it wasn't trivial, right, to, to figure out that we had uh, a way to make a smaller set. Instead of all of you, we could make some subset, which contains all of the, uh, all of the uh, horizontal lines. And then we have a different subset, which contains all the vertical lines, and, um, and they, they actually have an o empty overlap. They have to check that they're open, that they're empty, and then we have the horizontal lines. 
horizontal lines are in uh, U naught and vertical are in V naught. So what we found is that if lines are um, uh, going to be um, if one of them is in, in, in U and the others in V, we don't know how we're going to deal with this, but that, that wasn't a problem. They'll both they'll be in both U and V, unless one of them is vertical and the other is horizontal. That would be a bad situation. If we had a vertical line and a horizontal line, this one's in V, this one's in U, but uh, U and V overlap, and so we don't see how we house them off. What we do then is we use uh, we house them off by this one is in U0 and this one is in V0, and that houses them off. So that houses the horizontal lines from the vertical lines. Okay, so that proves that the space of lines is actually Hausdorff. And we've already seen that because we had only two charts, it's uh, got a countable basis of open sets. And so it is, in fact, actually a manifold. You might wonder what manifold it is. After all, we've just shown it's a two-dimensional manifold um, because our charts were valued in, uh, in numbers our charts, let's go back to our charts here, our charts, they give an, a slope and intercept here and a slope and intercept here um, for these lines and you have a, a transition map uh, matching them to each other. What, what exact, what is this? Well, it's a surface, right? Because it has two coordinates. It's, a, it's gotta be some kind of surface. The space of lines in the plane is a surface, but what surface is it? Um, and it's, it's not completely clear, right, from this description. It's not completely clear how you, how you see it as actually uh, drawing out some kind of surface but it turns out to be uh, a famous uh, surface, the Mibius strip. The lecture notes at this point give numerous uh, additional examples um, proving that various things are, are manifolds, that the set of orthogonal matrices is a manifold, uh, and the projective line is a manifold, and the projective space is a manifold, but I don't want to do all of those examples because it's a bit too much for us. Um, let's just do a little bit of that, uh, some of the examples. One of the most important examples in all of differential geometry is the Grassmannian. It's an awful name, Grassmannian. It doesn't give you any intuition for what it means, but um, it's a very simple thing. Um, the uh, the Grassmannian of uh, p-dimensional. linear subspaces in a vector space V. And what is a Grassmannian? It's just the set of all. It's a word for the set of all p-dimensional linear subspaces. Okay, So we write it as Grassmannian PV and it's the set of all the set of p-dimensional linear subspaces of a vector space V. V could be a real or complex vector space, or even in the notes we, we work with uh, Grassmannian, or with, with Grassmannians for um, uh, quaternionic vector spaces, but that's not essential. It, the, the main thing is just to think about it in the case of the real numbers. Um, why is it so important? Well, uh, you could imagine that uh, when you've worked through all the, the details of linear algebra, um, you could start thinking about what happens if you allow the entries of a matrix to vary as smooth functions of parameters? Um, if you allowed that to happen, then you would get maybe uh, variable uh, kernels and images of this of this uh, this, this matrix. So um, so if you allow families of linear transformations, you end up with families of kernels, families of images, so families of linear subspaces. And so if you want to study smoothly varying linear algebra, you have to allow yourself to think about the Grassmannian. You have to think about it as a manifold. We need its abstract manifold uh, concept, and we need to understand how it becomes a manifold, how to make, make its charts work out. In a way, what we're doing is a kind of, of, um, of uh, feedback. We, we already know linear algebra. We already know calculus. Now what we want to do is put the two together Differential geometry is going to be about manifolds, um, but it's differential geometry. That is to say, we differentiate. And differentiating means studying linear approximations. And as we move things smoothly, those linear approximations are going to vary smoothly with parameters. And so inevitably, we'll have to study smoothly varying linear algebra. 
and so we have to study the Grismanian. So the Grismanian is an essential ingredient in differential geometry from the beginning. In some sense, what we're trying to do is to take the, to take linear algebra and use it to study manifolds. But we're also going to take manifolds and differential geometry and use it to study linear algebra. We'll make a better linear algebra by uh, by allowing variable parameter matrices. And then we'll make a better differential geometry by being able to use that better linear algebra. In some sense, they're going to feed off of each other, linear algebra and differential geometry. And that's a, a theme that we'll see throughout all of these lectures. For, for some uh, notation and for terminology, um, it's traditional to, to call, uh, to use the term projective space or projectivization, PV, is, uh, is the Grismanian of one-dimensional subspaces of V. In other words, it's the set of lines through the origin. Not all lines, but just lines through zero in V. In other words, the set of one-dimensional linear subspaces. And it, again, it has the name, um, the projectivization of V, or it's also called uh, projective space. And of course, it depends in some sense on V, but just as linear algebra really doesn't depend that much on the vector space, that they're all all the ones of the same dimension are isomorphic. In the same way, all the projective spaces will, of, uh, that are uh, built on isomorphic vector spaces are, are isomorphic manifolds. We'll, we'll see uh, how to construct manifold structures on the Grismanian in general, and then we'll take a look at how the charts work out, how and how the transition maps work out in a simple example of, of a projective space. So we want to construct some charts on the Grassmannian in general, and then we'll look at this special case of projective space. Um, how do we construct this, these charts? Um, uh, what we're going to do is simply to pick um, some uh, uh, subspaces, linear subspaces, P0 and Q0 contained in V, so that they're actually um, V is the direct sum. In other words, that uh, that just means that um, that they span V and that they intersect trivially. They intersect at zero. Okay, so we're going to split it up our vector space into a direct sum of two subspaces, and then um, we'll write uh, vectors of each vector in V as V is some x a y pair, where the x is going to be in. Um, P naught and the y is going to be in Q naught. So we've written it as a direct sum, and we split up the vectors. You could, if you really wanted to, write it. You might prefer to write that as x plus y. You think of the vectors as actually living inside v, or you could write it in this notation x comma y, identifying it as uh, projecting to the two parts. Um, so then, then what we'll do is we'll let um, u, we'll create some some, some u contained in the Grismanian, this is going to be the domain for a chart, and it's going to be the set of all um, of all p linear subspace of dimension p. Uh, so p is a linear subspace, a set of all of them contained in v, uh, dimension equal to given little p, um, uh, and with um, not all of them, but just so that um, uh, P is the graph of some um, of some y equals a x, some linear map a takes p naught to q naught. Okay, so geometrically, what we're picturing is that we're going to have a p naught and we're going to have a q naught. And we split up our vector space to a direct sum of these two, and then typically most of the, we imagine that most of the linear subspaces that pass through the origin, I'm not drawing a very good job of doing a good job of drawing it through the origin, um, that the linear subspaces that go through the origin are, are typically going to mostly be graphs of uh, linear maps from p to, p naught to q naught. So this will be some p, some subspace p, and it's the graph of some of some map. Um, so that'll give us a, uh, a chart. Um, similar to the sorts of charts we've taken before. Uh, how is the chart going to be written out uh, if you have a um, uh, linear subspace? So phi of the graph of the graph, capital P, of um, the uh, equation y equals 
uh, AX should just be the matrix A or the linear map A. So A is a linear map from P naught to Q naught. Okay, it's a linear map. So that's going to be a linear map. It's not really a, a point of Euclidean space RN, but it is more or less, morally speaking, because it's actually going to have a, a matrix a form. Okay, um, so um, or uh, to be more precise, we might say phi um, of uh, uh, P is um, the matrix entries. To be a bit more precise, uh, it really should be the matrix entries of A in some basis. Well, bases of P naught and Q naught. So we could write it out as matrices. I want to be a bit vague about that sort of thing mostly because it, it's a bit uh, pedantic and silly to worry about the details of the difference between a linear map and a matrix when we have fixed uh, subspaces to deal with. Um, so we won't worry a lot about that. Um, right. So in other words, what we do is we take this linear subspace, and if it happens to have the form of a graph, we just write out the matrix or write out the linear map of that graph. Now what we want to do is to worry about transition maps. So it helps at this point to imagine that we split up the variables more into some fine refinement of the variables um, in some other way. Um, so if we imagine that we write each uh, vector not as x, y, but instead as, say, having uh, two x parts and two y parts. Um, so split it up. And you can think in terms of a basis, that you have some basis, and that the first so many uh, basis um, and elements are thought of as spanning some some x component, then some x bar components, then some y's and some y bars. So it has uh, entries as a vector given by these kinds of x and x bar variables. So then each p-dimensional subspace will be the graph of the y and y bar vector as some linear transformation of the x and x bar vector. So we split up uh, the, the, the what we previously were calling x into two pieces. Now we're calling them x and x bar. Just not not for complex conjugation. That bar just means some other variables also called x, but different ones. Um, so it's convenient to have this sort of notation in which we can think of this uh, this splitting into two components is now splitting into four components in some way. Um, so we split up our first component vector into two components and our second one into two components somehow. And so this guy here is what we were previously calling A. It's a single matrix. Those aren't numbers. Those are also matrices, right? It has sub-matrices. The matrix A has sub-matrices, little a, little b, little c, little d. Um, so that's splitting it up into pieces. And so we imagine that every time we can write a linear subspace, capital P, in this form, then we associate to it on our chart, we associate to it this matrix. But suppose instead we could somehow we could also write the same subspace P, not just in this form, but also as somehow writing that the X bar and Y bar components were some um, uh, A, B, C, D matrix, now there's a different letter A, um, of the X and Y components. If it were somehow possible to write it not only this way, but also this way, and, and by, by making the y and y bar variables be linear functions of the x and x bar variables, but also somehow solving for x bar and y bar variables in terms of x and y variables as linear functions. Um, then we can do a little bit of linear algebra and just check what that would have to be, that this matrix, A, B, C, D, to express the barred in terms of unbarred variables in this expression, would exactly have to be uh, minus b inverse a. I'm not going to do the linear algebra. I'll just write down the answer, uh, this horrible answer. Um, this thing, okay? Then uh, this is how these this the, this has to be written. So if you can change variables from using uh, uh, linear subspaces being given by solving for certain variables in terms of others, and you can change which variables you solve for, that changes the chart, right? That changes us from a chart which describes a linear subspace in terms of these uh, in terms of these kinds of matrices and these kinds of linear maps to one that uses these matrices and these linear maps. Um, so for certain variables in, in terms of other variables. And the change the, uh, of, from, from, of linear algebra from using um, x and x bar variables as the independent variables to using x and y variables as independent variables is given exactly by this. So this is the transition map between the charts. 
So as a consequence, we get that the Grismanian is in fact um, a manifold, and that these um, these matrix entries that we'd write down for this kind of matrix are 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 somehow the 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 parameters that locally describe it. They they, they give us a chart. How many of the of these parameters are there? Going back to the, the the story, perhaps it's a bit simpler to go back to writing this y equals ax in that chart. Um, so if p is the subspace y equals ax, uh, the given by that linear map, then of course we said phi of p should be the matrix A. And that will give us a matrix of a particular size. So we've proven the smoothness of the, um, of the transition maps uh, in this situation. So it's very simple that way. Um, We've computed out the transition map is given by this horrendous thing. It's a lot of linear algebra, but it does give us uh, an explicit and smooth transition map. It's smooth because inverting matrices is, is a smooth operation. Um, and so, um, so what we've now got is a, is a, is, is a, a chart. Uh, and, and when we change charts, we change by a smooth transition map. What we still don't know is that the resulting thing is Hausdorff and has a countable basis of open sets. How do we get the countable basis? That's straightforward because, in fact, uh, once we pick a particular basis for our vector space V, we can uh, choose certain of the variables to be X variables and certain to be Y variables. And, and you could permute them around and check, pick different ones to be x and to be the x variables and to be the y variables in this argument. So, and we know that if you make that, if you change which which is which, you always change by a transition map like this. So you can pick any of the variables to be the x variables, any variables to be the y variables, and then look at all of the all the subspaces p that are graphs of maps y equals ax. And because every subspace, every linear subspace, is somehow the graph of some of the variables, certain of the variables, as linear functions of others of the variables in our in our description of our vector space in a basis. There's always some choice of variables you can get, so that the every subspace is somehow a graph of a linear map. That means, therefore, that um, we've got a, a, a bunch of charts that cover the whole Grassmannian. So we've covered uh, covered with. We've covered with finitely many charts. Finitely many charts. Okay, so that's 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 something of accomplishment. We've covered with finitely many charts, and um, because you only really need to take one basis, and then you can pick certain of the variables to be x and certain to be y's, and you can permute around which ones are which, and that there's finitely many variables, so finitely many permutations of them, and so that's uh, that's a finite set of charts that cover the whole thing. Um, so that gives us, therefore, a countable, um, a countable basis of open sets. Okay, so that's good. Now, what about being Hausdorff? Um, uh, we've got to still worry about that property. Well, in in that case, we can do something a bit different. What we can do is to actually um, use any um, choice of subspaces, of linear subspaces. Um, if we uh, make our, our choices of subspaces, we can do it with a little bit of linear algebra. We can convince ourselves that we can get any two linear subspaces, if any two linear subspaces of the same dimension. You can always get them by some linear transformation to be um, to be graphs in the same uh, chart. In other words, to be graphs uh, of uh, the y's as linear functions of the x's for some choices of x's and y's after maybe you do some linear transformation. Of them, so uh, so that's just going to be a bunch of linear transformations, linear algebra, and so it won't really cause any trouble for the the smoothness of the transition maps, and so that's that makes sure it's Hausdorff because they're in the same chart domain. Okay, so by our general argument that our general test for Hausdorffness, we just have to get them to be in the domain of the same chart, and we can do that by some linear transformation, which will linearly uh, affect the transition map. So as a consequence, we have that the um, the, the, the Grassmannian is, in fact, uh, a smooth manifold. Um, and, in fact, we have its dimension. Um, if we go back and look at our charts, we can see, um, we can see what, they, what, what dimension it comes out to be. We have that the Grassmannian P planes in V is a smooth manifold. Well, I'll just say manifold. Um, and that its dimension 
uh, you have to take a look. It's well, it's identified linear maps from one space to another space. One space had dimension p, and the other space had uh, had dimension, uh, let's say, um, n minus p, where n is the dimension of the vector space v, because this was uh, it was split it up into a p um, naught and a q naught. Um, this one had same dimension p. This had dimension n minus p, and we looked at linear maps from one to the other. So matrices, and the matrices had to be n minus p by p matrices, capital A. So you can see the dimension right there. In the notes, there's some explicit uh, example worked out to uh, show you the transition maps, um, how they actually work out for um, for the for projective space, uh, three-dimensional projective space. But uh, I don't want to do all the examples from the notes in uh, in the, the lectures, so uh, we'll just move on uh, to our to our next issue, which is really to understand functions and maps of manifolds. Um, so we need to f uh, figure out that there are smooth functions, and um, and we need to figure out uh, how to give examples of of smooth maps between manifolds, and that'll be our next lecture.